He walked the earth nearly 5,000 years ago. Hollywood resurrected his name and made him the star of the mummy. He is the Christian man, the supernatural powers rising from his trespassed tomb in search of his long lost love. But he is more than film fantasy. He is real. And his name is Imhotep. Imhotep's undiscovered mummy is believed to be buried somewhere beneath the sands of Saqqara, Egypt's fabled city of the dead. Resting in his long-lost tomb are 5,000-year-old secrets of how the pyramids were built, the birth of medicine, and the origin of mummies. Imhotep, the man who is the mummy. city of the dead, a vast cemetery in a culture that made preparation for death 
the main focus of life. For nearly the last 200 years, archaeologists have been excavating this area for the tomb of Imhotep. It was here that Imhotep built the Step Pyramid as the tomb for the Pharaoh Djoser. birth of Jesus and the beginning of the Common Era, an era more than 2,000 years after the death of Imhotep. Uh, this place must have been considered very important in ancient times because there is an accumulation of Ptolemaic and Roman period mummies around this old kingdom shaft. That means that people then, even after 2,000 years, knew that somebody important was buried here.
papyri, one name kept appearing in miraculous stories and legends. Imhotep. He turns fallow fields into bountiful harvests. He makes barren women fertile. He transforms dried riverbeds into life-giving waters. The stories about him were so fantastic and written so many centuries after his death, the scholars claimed the great sage was an invention of later times. They dismissed Imhotep as nothing more than a myth. That all changed on January 2nd. 1926. At an archaeological dig near the Steppe Pyramid, the dig foreman found the base of a large stone statue. He called for the inspector of antiquities, Cecil Firth. Firth read the glyphs, a list of astounding titles. Chancellor of the King of Lower Egypt, first under the king of Upper Egypt, architect of the Great Mansion, high priest of Heliopolis, and then the name of the one man who held all these titles. This one discovery propelled Imhotep from myth to historical reality. It was the first piece of archaeological evidence bearing the name of Imhotep from his own lifetime. The block of granite, now on display at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo, proved to be the base of a statue of Pharaoh Djoser. It is a piece from one of the first life-size statues ever made. When Pharaoh Djoser put Imhotep's name on his statue, it was the only time in 3,000 years of Egyptian history that the name of a mortal appeared on a king's statue. The king loved him, and the king put his name and wrote his name and titles for the first time on the base of his statue. And this is unique. It shows the position of this man. It shows how he was respected, not only by the king, by, but by the one million Egyptians who lived in that time. After Firth's death in 1931, other archaeologists picked up the quest for Imhotep's tomb. They reasoned that Imhotep's mummy must be buried in the shadow of his one remaining earthly achievement, the Steppe Pyramid of Saqqara. The Steppe Pyramid is revolutionary in its size, shape, and materials. It is the first pyramid ever built. It is the first monumental stone building in history. And rising 204 feet off the desert floor, it was bigger than anything that had ever been built before. Surrounding the pyramid above ground are 37 acres of shrines, storehouses, altars, courts, gateways, and secondary tombs, covering an area the size of more than six New York City blocks. Constructed for the Pharaoh Djoser, the Step Pyramid was Djoser's tomb at death. But while alive, the Step Pyramid was a potent symbol of the Pharaoh's earthly power. Building the first pyramid was also instrumental in unifying Egypt into the first nation-state in history. The pyramid was the national project of the whole nation, and therefore the whole people has to unite. Then building the pyramid, in my opinion, united Egypt. It made everyone to work for the king. Before the Steppe Pyramid, 
A pharaoh's tomb was a long, low, rectangular mud brick structure called a mastaba, the Arabic word for bench. This computer-generated reconstruction of a first dynasty mastaba was originally built a hundred years before Imhotep's time. The site is being excavated at Saqqara, just a half mile from the Steppe Pyramid. For more than 500 years, the kings of Egypt were buried beneath mud-brick mastabas. And then came Pharaoh Djoser and his architect Imhotep, and changed the face of Egypt forever. How and why did they do it? Aided by 5,000 years of erosion by sand and wind, archaeologists discovered that at the heart of the Steppe Pyramid is a series of finished stone mastabas. Scientists can follow the stages of construction because after each stage, the workers dressed what they thought was the completed building in white limestone. Tracing these finished layers has led scientists to conclude that the Steppe Pyramid evolved from a series of inspired adaptations. After each stage of building, Imhotep continued to stack one stone mastaba atop another until the monument dominated the landscape. It was the biggest building in the world. Then let us see how the step pyramid was built by Imhotep. First, we had uh, one mastaba, the first mastaba built of limestone. He added after that two small sections to accommodate another three mastabas. After that, he made another extension here to include the other uh, mastabas. He put two more in the top then now we can have the step pyramid complete. In Hotep's pyramid, Sparta. Long been lost, 
but its shape survives in the hieroglyph for the Ben Ben, which ends in a triangular pyramid shape. For Imhotep, high priest of Heliopolis, the triangular shape of the sun's rays and the Ben Ben stone as mirrored in the step pyramid would have been a powerful tool to guarantee life after death. Egyptian built pyramids in the shape of a pimbin and also in the same time to be connected with the sun god. But the pimbin also can be represented as the top of the pyramid. It is the symbol for the sun god raid. It is the symbol of finishing the pyramid. It is the symbol of the king to be a god. Just a few hundred yards from the step pyramid, deep within the burial chamber of the pharaoh Eunice, is further evidence of what the pyramid meant to the ancient Egyptians. Covering the walls of the tomb are carved hieroglyphic writings called the pyramid texts. This guide to the afterlife instructs the king to climb a staircase to the heavens. There, the king would catch a ride with the sun god, Ray, to eternal life. For the ancient Egyptians, the step pyramid was literally a stairway to heaven. But Imhotep's plans for helping Pharaoh Joseph reach the afterlife were not limited to the exterior of the pyramid and the above ground temple complex. His plans extended beneath the sands. Dr. Salima Ikram, a leading authority on ancient Egyptian burial practices, goes underground to shed light on Imhotep the mummy. Lurking below the desert sands, cut into solid rock, is the most extensive and complicated network of shafts, tunnels, false doors, chambers, and galleries the Egyptians ever created. Three miles of underground corridors connect 400 subterranean rooms, filled with everything from food to art, gold, and jewels. Imhotep created an extensive maze of dead ends and false doors to lead grave robbers away from the great riches and the one object that caused the entire pyramid complex to be built, the burial chamber of the pharaoh. This is the final resting place of the pharaoh Zoser of the third dynasty. Here there's a shaft that goes down for 90 feet, leading to a small granite burial chamber, which was closed by a granite plug weighing three and a half tons. Inside this chamber lay the sarcophagus, and inside the sarcophagus was a wooden coffin, which contained the mummy of the pharaoh Zoser. It's here, at the bottom of Djoser's tomb shaft, where Imhotep the architect and Imhotep the doctor converge. As the king's vizier, Imhotep would have been in charge of building the burial shaft, and as high priest, he would have supervised Joseph's mummification. It's through the perfection of mummification that Imhotep would have gained an extraordinary knowledge of the workings of the human body. But when archaeologists entered Joseph's tomb in 1934, all they found of the pharaoh were his torso, right arm and left foot. If you look at the mummy, or the bits rather that are preserved, you can see the foot is beautifully preserved. It consists of linen bandages wrapped around the foot, and these are done in such great detail that you can see the toenails and indeed all the tendons of the foot. Now, this is very typical of third dynasty mummification, so clearly this must be a portion of the body of the pharaoh Zoser. 200 years after Joseph's death, the process of mummification was nearly perfected, exemplified by this beautifully preserved 4,000-year-old mummy of Nefer. Not only is the body wrapped and the linen sculpted, but a new technique has been introduced, evisceration, 
the surgical removal of the body's internal organs. If it was Imhotep who developed these techniques, then his mummy should be as well preserved as Nefer's. Now, if we find Imhotep, we can expect that his body will be modeled, and presumably his face and details of his physique would be painted or modeled on um, the bandages. So we would indeed have a very good idea as to what he looked like in his life or what he thought his ideal self should look like for the afterlife. Mummification had a great influence on Egyptian medical practices. By supervising the embalmer's work, Imhotep would have gained extensive knowledge about the position of internal organs and human anatomy. He may have applied what he learned from preserving the dead to healing the living. A few miles from the Steppe Pyramid at the Giza Pyramids, scientists recently discovered archaeological evidence that Imhotep may have had the perfect living laboratory for practicing medicine. Dr. Zahi Hawass, one of Egypt's foremost archaeologists, made a spectacular find near the Great Pyramid at Giza in 1990. Hawass unearthed the complex where the workers who built the Great Pyramids were housed and buried. Hawass's excavation of the workers' village and cemetery is shedding new light on how the pyramids were built and changing old ideas about how the workers lived and died. From each skeleton there is a story. A story of the past, a story of those Egyptians who created and made this wonderful structure. Hawass exhumed the corpses of 20 workers and sent the skeletons to a nearby lab where the bones were examined and x-rayed. As one might expect, the x-rays revealed that many of the workers had suffered injuries. The big surprise was that many of those injuries had been treated with very effective medical procedures. There is evidence of broken arms healing after being set in splints. The end of this leg bone is well healed, proof that the worker received good care and lived for years after the surgical amputation of his lower leg. One set of x-rays and bones reveals evidence of the first known brain surgery in history. This skull is for a man that's suffering from a cancer which sends metastasis to the bone in, and can see it uh, in this lesion. And uh, there, there are evidence that they may try to make some surgical operation that appears from this chiseling effect on the, on the bone outside. In 2500 BCE, Egyptian doctors chiseled a hole in this skull to relieve the pressure caused by the patient's brain tumor. Dr. Hawass argues not only is this a testimony to ancient Egyptian medical practices, but it may be additional evidence that the pyramids were not built by slaves. The traditional theory is that 100,000 slaves labored for 40 years to build each of the great pyramids. But Hawass has found documents in the workers' village that proves the workers were paid documents and the workers' bones lead Hawass to conclude that each pyramid was built in about 20 years by 20,000 Egyptian workers. The workers were motivated by nationalism and had the benefit of emergency medical treatment. One important evidence also that the workmen were not slaves is the examination of the bones. If they were slaves, they would never do a brain surgery. As the builder of the first pyramid, Imhotep may have treated injuries suffered by workers and presided over the world's first trauma center. 
Hippocrates, the Greek who was recognized as the father of modern medicine, lived in the 4th century BCE. But there is evidence that Imhotep, 2,000 years before Hippocrates, was practicing modern medical techniques. Dr. Hamdi El Rafay, a physician and professor of ancient Egyptian medicine at the American University in Cairo, believes Imhotep may have authored the world's first medical treatise. Here, in a Cairo marketplace, Dr. Hamdi is using an ancient Egyptian manuscript to search for ingredients Imhotep may have prescribed. Ancient Egyptian medicine contained large doses of magic, but many of the treatments were scientifically valid and effective. Chief among them was the widespread use of honey as an ingredient in the dressing used to treat wounds. Honey is an absolutely marvelous ingredient because honey is bactericidal and bacteriostatic, which means that bacteria cannot grow and are killed by honey. So you can imagine the effect of that on wounds. Put honey on any wound today, and I can guarantee it will not become infected. Honey kills bacteria. Dr. Hamdi discovered the healing power of honey in an ancient Egyptian medical treatise that may be based on Imhotep's writings. The Edmund Smith Papyrus, named after its first owner, is the oldest and most important medical papyrus ever found. Dating from 1550 BCE, the document lists 48 traumatic injury cases and their treatments. The world's first known use of sutures to close wounds, moldy bread to cure infection, and raw meat to stop bleeding. The papyrus begins with injuries to the head and then works its way down the body. The same organizational structure used by Gray's Anatomy today. The Edwin Smith papyrus is a very scientific papyrus in the sense that it presents a case as we would present it today to our medical students. It has a title, what to do about it, how to diagnose it, how to treat it, and how to do a follow-up. The Edwin Smith papyrus predates Hippocrates by over a thousand years. And based on the archaic language in the papyrus, Dr. Hamdi suspects that the medical treatments were passed down from even older documents, documents that could be buried with Imhotep. In the event that we do find the tumor from Hotep, it would be a fascinating find surpassing that of Tutankhamun, provided it was found intact. Because we expect to find medical texts way beyond the texts that we have now. Again, we expect to find medical instruments that Imhotep used in his practice. So this would be a find unsurpassed like any in history. Some scholars speculate that if Imhotep's tomb and the ability to read Egyptian hieroglyphs had not been lost, doctors today would swear an Imhotepic oath instead of the Hippocratic oath. Finding Imhotep's tomb would elevate Imhotep to his rightful place in history as the father of modern medicine. The search for his tomb exploded in 1922 when British archaeologist Howard Carter found another tomb, that of a little-known New Kingdom pharaoh, a boy king named Tutankhamun. Filled with a dazzling array of gold and jewels, King Tut's tomb, the only pharaoh's tomb ever found intact, renewed hopes that Imhotep's tomb might also rest unplundered, filled with treasures and priceless clues about the dawn of Egyptian civilization. found the statue base bearing Imhotep's name, he died. The quest to find Imhotep's tomb was picked up by the British archaeologist, Walter Emery. Walter Emery! 
In 1964, Emery laid siege to the area north of the Steppe Pyramid, near Cecil Firth's old excavation site. 400 workers were marshaled. For the first time, a bulldozer was used. Emery's expedition quickly stumbled onto a bizarre find, a vast network of catacombs filled with thousands of neatly stacked clay jars. Inside each jar, Emery found a mummified ibis, a bird sacred to Egyptians, and left to Imhotep as an offering. Emery and his men thought they were closing in on Imhotep's tomb. Kafti Sa'ad was 18 years old when he was hired to work on the Emery dig. Today, he remembers what it was like discovering the ibises. It was a great pleasure to find something so important after all that hard work. We had a big celebration, like a wedding. The workers eventually disinterred one and a half million mummified ibises. They went on to find a gallery full of mummified baboons, another animal identified with Imhotep. Then they broke through the baboon gallery and discovered a deep Old Kingdom burial shaft, a chamber dating from the time of Imhotep. When they reached the bottom of the shaft, they found a clay jar bearing the stamp of King Joseph. But that was all. Walter Emery's seven-year search for Imhotep's tomb ended when he died in 1971. The Kafti Sa'ad's search for Imhotep continues. Sa'ad now works for Polish archaeologist Karol Mishlewicz in his dig site on the west side of the Steppe Pyramid. Mishlewicz has already unearthed mummies that confirm the site was an active burial place and sacred pilgrimage site for 2,000 years after Imhotep's death. <laughs> But among the Greco-Roman mummies, Mishlevietz discovered Old Kingdom evidence, a simple wall made of stone, mud bricks, and mud mortar. This construction technique dates the site to the Third Dynasty, the time when Imhotep lived and died. Then, when workers digging next to the wall uncovered brilliant bits of blue tile, Mishlevietz knew he had a rare and exciting clue in the search for Imhotep. For these blue faience tiles have only been found in one place, in the funerary complex of Pharaoh Djoser. So it's quite probable that we may find here the tomb of somebody, an official, who was almost as important as the Pharaoh himself. Could that person be Imhotep? Mishlevietz's team was energized, convinced they would succeed where others had failed. The workers continued to dig eastward towards the steppe pyramid, looking for the entrance to the subterranean parts of the tomb. For months, one after another, new burial shafts were excavated and explored. Then, at the bottom of one of the shafts, they discovered another Third Dynasty wall. When they broke through, they uncovered the facade of a tomb. When we removed the heap of stones and bricks accumulated in front of the facade of the tomb, we saw the first piece of uh, relief, and there was the hieroglyphic sign P, which also occurs in the name of Imhotep. Mishlevietz, like Firth and Emery before him, 
was standing on the brink of one of the world's greatest archaeological discoveries. After months of clearing rubble and careful conservation, Mishlevietz and his team made an amazing discovery. The structure is not a tomb, for it contains no sarcophagus, but rather a rare funerary chapel. The hieroglyph revealed that the owner is a powerful prime minister, or vizier, a previously unknown figure in history with the formal name of Merif Nebeth and the nickname Fefi. The hieroglyph that had tantalized Mishlevietz was not from the name Imhotep. If he was disappointed, that feeling disappeared as he entered the funerary chapel. The chapel is one of the best preserved ever found. Dating from the end of the 5th dynasty, around 2300 BCE, means Fefi lived about 400 years after Imhotep. Like most funerary murals, the reliefs depict idealized scenes from Fefi's days to come in the afterlife. Days spent hunting, fishing, or enjoying the company of his four wives and girlfriends. But these perfect days of the afterlife will be lived only if the vizier's relatives bring proper offerings to the chapel's two false doors. This was a place where the living was contacting the dead because priests of uh, funerary cult and family members were bringing here offerings in order to deposit them in front of the false door where the soul of the dead was supposed to come out in order to collect them. The funerary chapel of Fefi is a spectacular find, the crowning achievement of this season's date. Just as Mishlevietz and his team are closing up the site, he stumbles upon one more discovery. While securing a previously explored burial shaft, one of Mishlevietz's workers discovered a secret corridor. A digital radar measuring device is brought in to find out where the corridor goes and how long it is. Careful not to slip down the 60-foot shaft, Mishlevietz's colleague climbs through the hole. The digital measuring device works like radar, sending out waves that reflect off surfaces and bounce back to the transmitter. The instrument measures a distance of 80 meters. That 80 meters means the corridor leads straight to the heart of the step pyramid. This shaft turned out to be the greatest sensation of the present excavation season, not because of the shaft itself, but uh, because uh, of a hole uh, existing in its northern wall. This hole leads to a subterranean gallery, which is at least 80 meters long and extends directly toward the Jezer pyramid. If the entrance to this huge tomb uh, exists on its eastern side, it must have been just beside the Jezreel Pyramid. And the person who was buried here has been someone of the highest stature in Egyptian society. Who knows, maybe Imhotep himself? Mishlevietz will have to wait until next dig season to find out. For now, almost 5,000 years after his death, Imhotep remains elusive. 
one question haunts his seekers. Will Imhotep's tomb ever be found intact? I really believe that the tomb of Imhotep should be intact. If this tomb will be discovered, and it will, sometime. Sometimes people who are not searching for this, they're looking for discovery of a tomb or a temple or something, and they will hit the name Imhotep, written in hieroglyphic. If any archaeologist will see that name in one... Yes, I'm gonna burn.